Any questions? No? Okay, then I suggest we pass on to Natasha. Thank you. Before I start, I want to ask you for your help, your assistance. Um, I have, um, my presentation is unplugged, so I, um, I have some images that I would like to pass around and ask you, uh, there's numbers on the back that you can see, and when I say that number that you would hold up the image and, and show it around, and afterwards you can also pass it around so that other people can also see it, but um, that would be really nice. So I will just pass around the images. So I want to um, talk about what we call the NSU complex. Um, I will um, give you a short introduction uh, into what we mean by NSU complex. Um, and I will um, talk about the People's Tribunal unraveling the NSU complex and why uh, in that course um, we commissioned forensic architecture to carry out uh, a counter forensic investigation into one of the uh, in, into one of the cases uh, as part of the NSU complex, um, I will try to uh, reflect on image politics in that respect. Um, yeah, visual codes or uh, codes of visibility and the discourse of images uh, as evidence, and you will see that also in the images that I pass around. Um, there is um, a use of images also in, um, in how the families of the victims try to make their case heard. Uh, and, uh, and there is a kind of um, constant reenactment in, in, the, in the knowledge uh, that, is, um, that is situated in, in the communities that were affected. And, um, and it's, uh, it's important um, to, yeah, to also see that as a, as a reenactment. And, um, and all of this um, I would like to place and, and reflect upon as part of struggles in what we call a post-migrant society um, and um, a society that, that tries to counter um, institutional and structural racisms um, and uh, sees itself as part of an international solidarity in the fight um, against uh, the rise of fascism and, and racism. Uh, when we talk about the NSU complex, it's really important to place it within a, uh, a larger continuity or continuities um, within the German history, but also uh, the larger history in Europe. And um, just to, to kind of go back to post-war, post-Second World War Germany, um, which of course um, was uh, just, you know, um, tried to um, forget um, in, a, in, a, in an act of amnesia, tried to forget its, its uh, fascist makings. Um, ten years after World War II ended, um, the first recruitment programs for what was then called guest workers um, were uh, established in Germany and, uh, and workers uh, entered uh, Germany in large numbers um, to work in the factories and to rebuild the country that was in ruins. Um, in the two crises, like in the two oil crises, the first one in 73, um, this program was stopped, so there was a recruitment ban um, in 1973, um, and then in the 80s, um, there were programs established to um, to, to encourage um, 
guest, so-called guest workers to uh, return home, uh, which was still this uh, this idea or this phantasma that um, in the in the German public mind that these people are still guests um, after living in two or three generations in Germany and that they they can return home. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is the history that I think is really important to, to look at when we look at um, the situation in which the NSU um, appeared, uh, in which, you know, a group of people radicalized um, and went underground in Germany. Um, in the 80s, during this time when uh, the, these, uh, these programs um, appeared in Germany about, you know, we have too many foreigners here, um, we, we have high unemployment rates. Um, uh, there were the first also arson attacks um, in Duisburg, for example, seven people died um, in 1984 uh, when uh, Nazis put a house on fire. Um, and then in the 90s, these arson attacks continued in, um, in Mölln, in Rostock, uh, Lichtenhagen. Um, and, and this is the time when uh, the so-called NSU, the National uh, Socialist Underground, um, radicalized um, in, a, in a town called Zwickau, and then went underground in 98, uh, 1998. Um, they committed at least nine racist murders, um, three bomb attacks, and 15 uh, robberies, bank robberies, until uh, in 1911 they and this is again like, a, there's a lot of different um, versions of this. They uncovered themselves or they, they kind of accidentally uncovered themselves when a bank robbery went wrong. Two of them uh, committed suicide uh, and the third person went on trial. Um, the official version of this is that this is a trio um, that operated um, in the, you know, kind of um, isolated as an isolated cell uh, underground. And um, why we call it the NSU complex is because there's um, a lot of evidence that the NSU must have had a network, that it must have had uh, an extensive network of supporters and of people who um, you could also say belonged to the NSU. Uh, and this is a um, a narrative that is um, completely rejected uh, by um, by the German government and by the institutions. Um, part of this network reaches into the German state. We, we have to talk about um, extensive um, evidence of collusion. Um, there is uh, the domestic secret service in, in, in Germany that has uh, a network of uh, confidential informants in the right-wing uh, groups um, and, and networks and um, we don't know the exact number of, of informants but um, we know that in the proximity of the NSU of this um, core trio um, there were a, a number of, um, in, of um, domestic secret service informants to name just one of them the um, Thüringische Heimatschutz, uh, THS, uh, is um, a, a very important uh, Nazi organization and the two leaders of that organization turned out to be government informants. So this also means that large parts of the Nazi networks were financed with government, uh, government money, whether knowingly or unknowingly. So NSU complex means that this is not a trio, that we don't see like though we, we don't consider this as an isolated cell and this then um, kind of expands um, the question of what is this and we see it as a, a, a composite of uh, neo-nazi terror um, collusion with the state and institutional and structural racism uh, the racism can be seen already in um, what happened during this murder series you have to imagine um, you know, there's a group that um, nobody knows about. There's a, a serial killing over the, the time of, of the, over the course of 10 years. People get killed with the same murder weapon. Um, and um, the police investigation sees um, the possible perpetrators only 
in the communities of the victims themselves. Why? Because all of the um, all of the victims have Turkish or Greek or uh, Kurdish sounding names. So they um, have a, a stereotype which is already present in the name of the police investigation. It, it was called the Bosphorus um, investigation. Uh, and uh, in the media it was called the Döner Kebab murders. Um, in the police investigations, the families themselves were under suspicion. They were um, interrogated repeatedly. They were wiretapped. They were observed, followed. Their financial situation was checked. Often they were presented with, um, uh, with fabricated evidence. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, like uh, they were told that their husband had a second wife and a photo was shown just to make them, to break them and to, to make them speak. Um, while evidence that was leading towards right-wing or racist um, um, perpetrators or motives were um, in all of the cases systematically ignored. Uh, and the media helped to, to create this image or to support um, this version of, um, you know, Turkish mafia, um, a, a culture where people just, it's just normal that they, that they kill each other because of family feuds, because of drugs, because of just, you know, that's just what they do. Um, so the fam families were systematically stigmatized also inside of their own communities. Um, they, um, they experienced after basically losing their family member, they experienced uh, economical, emotional, and also social damage because uh, after a while, uh, you know, you have to imagine like some of them, they were investigated for over seven years. They were followed every day. Um, then, you know, after some time, the business goes bad and, you know, also the, it, it causes the marriage to break up or um, also the neighbors start to think maybe there's actually something true to this story. So this is, this experience, um, a lot of the, um, the families, like especially the families in, in Kolbstraße where one of the nail bomb attacks uh, happened, they call this the bomb after the bomb. So the, the first bomb was the nail bomb um, and the second one was basically this, um, yeah, the stigmatization and criminalization that happened uh, to them. Um, so uh, the, the, race, uh, the racist stereotyping, the racist investigation by local police and federal investigators and the racist stereotyping by media um, created a sort of hysterical blindness, even in left-wing circles, in anti-racist and anti-fascist circles. Um, nobody really um, followed this as something, you know, um, uh, that, 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 that was flawed. Um, so when the NSU um, was finally uncovered in 2011, it was a shock for everyone. Like, how could this have happened? You know, and then also the question, how could um, a group operate underground for 10 years, murdering people and not be found? Um, you know, in, in Germany, we had um, the Red Army Fraction and there's uh, laws um, that, were, um, that were put in place during that time that, that basically make it impossible for someone to operate underground actively in Germany, not be found. Um, so um, all of this um, created, you know, a need to to reflect, like what has actually happened. Also within the activist circles, there need to, needed to be something to be learned from from this uh, ex um, from this experience. And and the first thing was really to um, yeah to mourn and to um, to think of of the victims and the family of of the victims that were left alone throughout this whole time. Um, so we, we always um, read the names of um, the victims that we know, um, and I want to read them to you. So this was um, Enver Shimshek, who was killed in 2000 in Nuremberg, Abdul Rahim Özüdoğlu, killed in 2001 in Nuremberg, 
Suleiman Tashköprü killed in 2001 in Hamburg, Habel Kilic killed in 2001 in Munich, Mehmet Turgut killed in 2004 in Rostock, Ismail Yasher killed in 2005 in Nuremberg, Theodoris Bulgaridis killed in 2005 in Munich, Mehmet Kubacek killed in 2006 in Dortmund, and only two days later, Halid Yozgat killed on 6th of April 2006 in Kassel. After that, in 2007, a German police officer, Michael Kieselwetter, was also killed by the NSU. What was attacked um, by the Nazis was um, a generation of people who um, have left the factories that their pa parents had worked in um, and they were small shopkeepers, they were entrepreneurs, they had their own businesses running, they were florists, they were key makers, they had restaurants or kiosks. Um, so they, were, they, they, they lived a life that was shaped by migration, but they were in, kind of in the center of, of society, of, of what we call a post-migrant society. So in reflection of this, um, we came back to, um, to a, a demonstration that happened basically one month after Halid Yozgat was killed in May 2006. And I would like those of you who have the images with number one to hold up the images. Um, because this was a demonstration that was key to us and that we wanted to learn from. Um, this is when 4,000 people marched in Kassel and Dortmund, organized by the families of the victims, the Josgat family in Kassel specifically. And we as, as activists in anti-racist and anti-fascist circles, we had to ask ourselves, where were we on this day? Because who was marching in that, in, in, on that day were the families of the victims in their communities, but there was, um, it, they were almost like ghosts. They were not seen. And this is a reflection on, I think, on the legacy of, of the so-called guest worker, uh, uh, you know, existence in Germany. Because these were the people who built up uh, Germany after the war, but they had no voice and they had no right to vote. They, they basically had no say in the country. Um, and there you have a big demonstration. And the demonstration says, no 10th victim. So they were demanding that there should be not another victim, but they were not seen or not heard. Because one year later there was another victim. And we have since also other victims uh, that we still have to see who, who the murderers are. Um, so after, you know, after the, the NSU was uncovered or uncovered itself, Many initiatives formed in, in all the places where the NSU had attacked. Uh, the the in initiative of the 6th of April in Kassel is one of them. And those initiatives, they kind of uh, gathered together um, and, and said that we need to, we need to do something um, to, yeah, to be with the families and their demands. Uh, Angela Merkel, at the time promised to the families a full investigation uh, and that these murders would be um, you know uh, fully cleared and, and fully like fully investigated um, but we could see when the trial started in Munich that uh, the, the judge would hold on firmly to uh, yeah to this theory of the trio and and basically, we, um, we could see that this was not doing justice to the families. The families were also in court. It was repeated, the silencing and not listening to, to their knowledge and to, to their testimony. So the violence, again, um, was repeated in the courtroom. Um, those who, uh, I think it's just one image of um, the courtroom. It's number two. Um, could the one who has number two hold up the image? Because the courtroom, um, when you see the courtroom, uh, the courtroom itself has um, a lot of um, 
poses a lot of questions towards visibility. Basically, um, the, vi the victims had to sit next to the perpetrators, next to the Nazis and their, and their lawyers. And they also had, when they, when they um, gave uh, testimony, they were just two meters away from, from uh, Beate Zschäpe, one of the uh, main trio, like one of the main NSU members. Um, but also from the audience, which was in the second floor, you could only see the Nazis, but you could not see uh, the families of the victims and, uh, and their lawyers. So there, again, this, um, these regimes of visibility uh, were repeated in the courtroom. This is where in 2014, these, these small initiatives decided um, to, to start working on a, on a people's tribunal um, to support the families and their lawyers in their efforts in court because the lawyers confirmed to us several times that it needs a movement outside, it needs pressure from the outside to, to win this or to, to have a say in court. Um, but also by creating you know, a civil society movement that would go beyond what can be done in court and to really, as you said, to imagine justice. And justice is not necess necessarily um, brought in court, um, but it has to be brought also in, in a civil society movement. It was, um, the purpose was also to create awareness and debate, it, uh, debate the NSU complex internationally because internationally there was no knowledge or no awareness of what was going on in Germany. Um, and to form spaces and narratives for those voices and those tem testimonies that were systematically silenced uh, throughout. Um, and it's, it was interesting when I came into the space today um, because um, the tribunal happened in a very, very similar space than the one that you're sitting in now. And I was part of the working group that um, tried to develop spaces for, for giving testimony within that space. And as you can see, like a, a space that is divided into stage and audience, it's, it's, very, it's very tricky to, um, to break up this dichotomy between those who are looking and those who are acting. And to, to give testimony and to be alone on stage is also um, requires a lot of courage when, when you've been exposed to so much violence. So actually what you see here is, is, is a reenactment of, of what we developed in, in the tribunal itself because we placed these uh, speaker islands within the audience. The table that you see here in that space, that was also where people were sitting who were giving testimony in the tribunal, you know, if you translate the space into the space of the tribunal, so that they would speak from within um, a community and not be isolated on stage. Um, so so um, a space where the, those affected directly and indirectly could um, formulate their demands and also where mourning could eventually take place uh, also in a, in a larger community, not just um, individually at home. And politically, we wanted to also um, put this, this knowledge that existed in the migrant communities all along, to put that in the center and to, to basically send out a strong message, message to the Nazis that um, they have already lost because we're not going anywhere. We're not going away. We're not, uh, you can't scare us by, um, by your actions. We are, we are here to stay and you've already lost because the, the society that you're trying to prevent is already here. So um, it, in that sense, it was also a celebration of exactly that kind of society that we want to live in. Um, if those of you who have the, the images with number three could hold up the images. Um, these are images from from the tribunal, and there you can maybe see um, the resemblance with this space. Also, in terms of holding up images um, and and you know um, posters with demands, and this is something that we really learned also from um, from the families because um, they were holding up images of 
what uh, Stefanos will then also um, give us more, you know, more insight into the investigation. But let me just briefly um, tell you why we um, thought that commissioning a forensic architecture uh, was necessary here and, and would, would be effective. So in, in, in the murder of Halid Yozgat in Kassel, um, the, uh, the situation was that uh, the domestic secret service agent Andreas Temme, who was a regular in that internet shop, um, was present at the time when Halid Yozgat was shot. Uh, he was shot twice by the same weapon that uh, all the other um, victims were also shot with. Um, he, Temme came in only for 10 minutes into the shop at that time. His father says, uh, Halid Yozgat's father, Ismail Yozgat says that after that he never came back. Still, he says he did not see anything. He did not uh, notice Ya Halid's body, body behind the counter when he left because he left probably just only seconds after Halid was shot. And this, the space that you see here, I think is, is so um, effective in in showing you how close the proximity was of where Andreas Temme was sitting, he was sitting here, and where Halid Yozgad was shot. Um, now, he says he didn't see and he didn't hear anything. Ismail Yozgad, the father of Halid Yozgad, since his son was killed, told the police, uh, Andreas Temme knows or he is involved because he must have seen my son. And he, he asked, uh, you know, the parliamentary inquiry commissions, he asked the judge of the trial in Munich to please come to the internet cafe and look at, I will show you how I found my son. And you will see that he's lying, Andreas Temm is lying. So that the knowledge was there all along, but no one would listen to, um, to Ismail Yozgat. Um, and even though he had very, um, amazing image strategies. Um, there's a number four image. Um, yeah, this is, this is Ismail Yozgat, uh, in the one with, you see Ismail Yozgat in, in, in the vertical image, uh, holding the image of his son in, in court. And he always had this image with, it, with himself. Um, and, and, these, and, and you see also the demonstrations um, on the day of the memorial for Halid Yozgat, and there again the images of the victims were held up. Yet um, his demands of looking at the space and this, his second demand to rename the street where his son was born and also murdered, Holländische Straße, into Halidstraße, were ignored. And so um, we we discussed that involving forensic architecture would, um, would be very effective in um, staging that knowledge and, and um, placing it or contextualizing it with the forensic methodologies that they have at hand and, um, and giving that analysis that the father already has with his knowledge, giving that um, yeah, a form uh, that would also be heard in court uh, and that would also then expand into, uh, in, yeah, into society as, as something that, that is uh, visible and that then would need to be, it would put pressure and would need to be discussed. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, Stefanos will tell us more about that. I just wanted to briefly show you also how we presented um, the, the final investigation uh, back in Kassel, because um, last year Documenta happened in Kassel, and we, um, we decided to, um, to, to make use of that as a sort of amplifier, to use Documenta as a huge amplification for these demands that the father had, and to bring it back to Kassel uh, with forensic architecture. So um, we, um, maybe those of you who have the images number five, uh, you, you could hold them up. Um, so 
so we were presenting, uh, you know, um, as in a, a collaboration with uh, various groups, initiatives, and individuals, a presentation at Documenta in Kassel, and um, brought the um, the investigation by forensic architecture, uh, yeah, to first to this audience, to an art audience, but. Um, it, uh, it soon became obvious that it was um, it put also pressure on um, yeah on on the government on the secret service and in the timeline you can also see the the responses that came after the the presentation in Kassel uh, one of them being uh, that the domestic secret service locked away the files about the case for 120 years. Um, so I, I would hand over to um, Stefanos to take us through the investigation. Thanks. And maybe, maybe after um, you, you could just collect the images again when you looked at them and, and just place them in the front here later on when you go out. Thanks. <laughs> 